bonsoir everyone um uh, good evening all I, i'm i'm very happy you all are here because today we have a seminar about saving the planet one megawatt at a time it is our first uh, geothermal event we will have another one uh, in next two weeks so we are obviously very happy uh, to have it today so for those that do not know EAG is um, a engineering and geoscience uh, society that is a professional society and it's uh, run by a group of volunteers. Uh, we the main um, aim uh, for us is to promote the development in engineering and geoscience fields. We also um, like to obviously learn about the energy transition topics and the renewable energy uh, topics. Uh, so as today, it is one of the renewable energy uh, topics about the geothermal energy. We also help um, people that are just joining the industry uh, early in their careers to obviously maybe gain some experience and um, uh, have the uh, networking opportunities to meet people that work in uh, different uh, companies. EIG is, uh, is an old, uh, quite a mature society. It has been uh, running uh, since uh, almost 70 years and it has a representation in Europe and US. And today we are very lucky that we have obviously uh, people from London and uh, UK EIG chapters uh, joining the call today. So here in Paris, uh, we are, the board team is uh, at the moment small, but it is uh, growing. So it's me as a president, Emilio as a vice president, and Guillaume as a treasurer. And we have uh, Elias that uh, represents the uh, students and uh, un universities. Uh, um, uh, and we have been recruiting more people. So I think in the next few weeks we, we will have obviously more members. But again, if you are interested to join EAG, then uh, uh, please uh, get in touch with us uh, via email or LinkedIn page. And the why to join EAG? Um, well, first of all, of course, to 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 meet uh, with uh, different professionals that work in uh, maybe other companies, and it also offers a great discount for all the EAG events um, in person. And also you have access of the online events uh, uh, well across across the world. And you also would have um, access to Earth doc uh, documents as well as you. Uh, there is a mentor and mentorship program that if someone is uh, starting their career, they uh, they can find someone that uh, mentors them to help to make the first steps as well for the experienced professionals. If you want to share your knowledge with uh, someone uh, much earlier in career, you're uh, welcome to do so. And our next two events, as I mentioned, that the next event we have a sequence of the geothermal energy events uh, next one will be on 12th of june it will be at the r d center uh, at slumberger here in paris but we will run the event in hybrid mode so those that are not in paris you can uh, still join it's it's not not a problem but of course it's more interesting if you are uh, present because we will see the uh, geothermal simulator at the R&D center in, in Slumberger. And then um, another very big event here in uh, Paris will be the GET 2023. It is, it, it is the fourth EAG Global Energy Transition Conference. We are very lucky that this year it will be in Paris, so definitely uh, try to join if possible. And if you're, let's say, in the UK, maybe you would like to visit uh, Paris for a few few days. And then actually next week already we have a, a conference, annual EAG conference in Vienna. I heard that some of you are, are going, so uh, that's uh, great, great to hear. But again, if uh, maybe 
you're still thinking about it, I think there should be an option to maybe join even now. So definitely try to attend uh, if uh, possible. And um, as mentioned, we do have a LinkedIn page. You can uh, follow it uh, and uh, just see the latest updates and events that we are doing. And uh, today, yes, we are very lucky. So we have uh, um, some representatives from um, local chapter Aberdeen on the call, and they obviously send us a message that you can uh, get in touch with the Aberdeen chapter by LinkedIn or by Gmail. And their next event is on the 27th of June. It will be a hybrid event, so people in France as well can join it. And it's about the geophysical survey in Aberdeenshire. So they, they were trying to see for the uh, search for nickel cobalt, uh, copper cobalt deposits in Aberdeen. So you can hear about the uh, technique they used to do it and as well what was the outcome actually how much uh, they did find and now I'm gonna hand over to Artyom to tell maybe a little bit about what's happening in uh, London. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Uh, we are a EG Local Chapter London, and we are a group of volunteers. So we are trying to cover uh, to cover our representative uh, companies who are employed in this uh, geoservice business around around the uh, London area. So we have volunteers from uh, TGS, CGG, SLB, Shia Water, BP, uh, Shell, Equinor, uh, some people from universities as well. So if you want to join, so please contact us uh, either via our LinkedIn page, so you can uh, scan core code of this page, or uh, email us. Uh, uh, I believe uh, email will be later on in the slides. So can you go to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. So uh, currently we have our president from Stride, and if you and we have a couple of uh, vacant positions with the people in transition. Who so we are looking for volunteers. So if you would like to take uh, uh, participation in our events, trying to organize them, or help us in communication via LinkedIn or via our email list. So please. Uh, get in contact and uh, please uh, participate in our uh, local activities. Uh, so next slide, please. So over the years, uh, we, we've been active for the last six years and uh, obviously during the uh, lockdown time, it was a challenging uh, time for us as well as for everyone. But because of that, we uh, went online and rather and switch from uh, in-person events to the online events and that uh, helped to increase our global footprint. Of course, uh, during lockdown, it's so easy to register for an event and you don't even have to join it. But uh, if we look at the uh, event bright statistics for the for this uh, specific two years, uh, we can see that it's over 1200 people were ever registered for uh, for at least one of our events and uh, like uh, conservatively estimating how many of them joined, we can say that in the range of 200 to 400 people all over the world did actually join us uh, for our uh, lectures. Uh, now we are trying to get back to in-person and sometimes we are doing in-person only events and sometimes we are running hybrid events. So next slide please. So when we had opportunity and we had a permission from the speaker, we uh, do record webinars and we, then we uh, put them on uh, YouTube. So it's a, there is a EG uh, YouTube channel, so where you can go and type and search for talks of uh, our local chapter as well as other uh, sibling local chapters of Paris, Netherlands, Germany, and so on. So you can find a selection of uh, really interesting talks uh, which happened during these uh, this last years. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, we are not planning any um, online events this summer. So the the last event before the summer break will have an in person only. Strictly, it will be a geological tour uh, over London, and we have a limit of fifteen people. So if you are interested to look at the 
uh, building stones and uh, constructions, looking at the hard rock, soft rock and uh, trace of heavy metal. So we encourage you to go to Eventbrite and uh, look for this uh, talk to register yourself or go to our uh, link in, in page and there is a link there uh, to this event. So please join us in case you're interested. It's, uh, it will be 22nd of June in, in central London. Okay, next slide, please. I think, uh, thank you, Artyom. Yeah. Okay, that that's was, that, thank you. That was th th thanks a lot. It was great to hear about the news in uh, London. So, a couple of um, ground rules uh, before uh, I introduce the speaker. Uh, if you could remain uh, mute for the time the presentation is uh, on, and uh, uh, again, you can post your questions in the chat. It's it's not a problem, and we will have a. Um, a Q and A session at the, once the speaker is finished. Um, so do definitely write your questions down, and uh, you will be able to turn your mic on once the speaker is uh, finished. Turn your camera on, but just for the time when the speaker is presenting, we would uh, really uh, advise to be remain mute for this time. So today's speaker is Andy Wood. Um, he is a very extraordinary man um, that um, worked for 30 years in oil and gas industry, in um, subsurface drilling and uh, wells, and uh, then he uh, he actually managed to transition from oil and gas into uh, geothermal a field. So currently he works as a subsurface manager at the Serafi Energy, that is a UK based uh, geothermal company. His uh, academic background that he uh, graduated uh, uh, with uh, earth science uh, diploma from uh, from Queen Mary College. Uh, he's uh, he's um, not only that uh, his career selection is that uh, he is now working in the renewable field, he also, um, he in his lifestyle reflects his, um, his, um, his uh, sustainable thinking. So he's a vegetarian and we are very, very happy to, to have him today. And uh, I, of course, we, are, we, we can't wait uh, for the tonight's uh, presentation on how to save the Planet one megawatt at a time. So thanks very much, Andy, for for joining uh, us today. Uh, well, thank you very much, Laura, for the introduction. Um, it's great to be here. It's always great to be given the uh, opportunity to to talk about um, geothermal energy and how it's uh, how it's developing. Um, so, without further ado. I will attempt to share my screen. Is that working? Yes, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Uh, so, as Laura mentioned, I'm, I'm the subsurface manager at uh, Serafi Energy. I'll probably best if I start at the beginning of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, I do come from an oil and gas, a gas background. Uh, 30 years experience uh, starting offshore on the rigs as a mud logger and then through well site and operations geology and uh, ultimately the last 15 years of my career in oil and gas was spent specifically focusing on operational optimization and cost saving. Uh, of course it's something that's important in, in oil and gas. Every operation likes to run as smoothly as possible but it's particularly important in um, in geothermal because we have much, much lower profit margins. Um, the title, modestly, of my talk is Saving the Planet One Megawatt at a Time. Um, and I'll talk about how we can decarbonize our energy through geothermal energy. So I'll, I'll start with a what to me is an alarming statement, and, and that's that the first geothermal energy, electricity, uh, was generated in Italy in 1904. Um, that's a long time ago, and to me, it's kind of shocking that all this time later, uh, geothermal energy still only accounts for 
0.3 of a percent of uh, of UK energy use. Uh, to me, that that figure is kind of um, an embarrassment, and it's a shame that uh, the geothermal energy hasn't been utilised more. Most people will be familiar with the source. Um, the centre of the, the globe is apparently very hot. It says here 6,000 degrees Celsius, which is the same temperature as the surface of the sun. Um, and the limiting thing about geothermal energy is that it's been reliant up until now uh, to specific geologies, um, which have to be in place in order to extract that heat. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a while. When most people think about geothermal, they think about um, this image here, or these two here. Um, first of all, ground source heat pumps. Um, shallow, they're shallow boreholes, and in some, some uh, instances, they're actually uh, coils of tubing in, in shallow trenches. Um, technically speaking, all ground source heat pump uh, energy isn't geothermal because it comes from uh, the sun's rays heating up the ground. Um, but the, the, most, uh, the most pictured image of geothermal energy is this one here. And this is the traditional um, open loop solution. Uh, and this is a scenario where two wells are drilled. Um, cold water is pumped down one well. That water is heated in the subsurface and then is harvested um, via travelling through the, the subsurface um, by a second well. It's been heated up in the core so it comes to the surface in the form of um, in, the, in a form of heat. In most instance, instances they're specific looking for um, the generation of electricity so the, the hot water is turned to steam that uh, in turn drives a turbine and generates the electricity. Um, the third and new uh, solution is the closed loop scenario. Um, when I say new, it's, it's something that is only recently being developed, um, but it's, it's kind of been around for a very long time in concept. Uh, in fact, even, even Nikola Tesla uh, looked at the idea of, of closed loop geothermal. Um, the difference between closed and open loop is something that I will go uh, into in a little while. Um, this particular image is from Serafi Energy, my, uh, my employer. Um, there are other companies, I'm happy to say, that are also doing closed loop solutions. You may have heard of uh, Evor. Um, or green fire, sage, uh, criterion, etc. There are a number of us, uh, still not enough, but we're, we are growing. When you talk about geothermal energy to people, they have an image in their mind. Um, and the first image that everybody thinks about is uh, Iceland. Uh, and as a result, the perception is that you need to live next to a volcano in order to benefit from geothermal energy. And indeed, uh, historically, that kind of is in the case, uh, not always volcanoes, but uh, active fault zones, places like the west coast of the US, um, Turkey, uh, the African Rift, Kenya, um, and Indonesia. Um, they're, they're the kind of famous places. Um, and as a result, there's that kind of pigeonholed, um, very nuanced, uh, kind of limited uh, view. Something else that people consider um, when they think, think about uh, geothermal energy, and particularly in France perhaps, is what I refer to as seismic hooliganism. Uh, and this is the secondary seismic activity which um, occurs when water is injected uh, into the subsurface in open loop situations. Uh, there's some debate as to why these secondary um, earthquakes are generated. Um, some say it's due to fault lubrication, others say it's due to pressure or temperature changes, but it's undeniable that, that this does happen. 
Um, and perhaps the most famous example is in northern France, um, in Wendenheim near Strasbourg, where um, there was a project that had completed drilling its wells. They thought the project was successful. They started pumping their vast amounts of water into the subsurface and generated a 2.8 uh, earthquake. So the project was immediately shut down and the earthquakes unfortunately continued. Um, in fact, 18 months later, the earthquakes were still coming and actually growing in magnitude. Um, so of course, in places like uh, Northern France and indeed the UK, that's, that's a problem. Um, in, in other locations like Indonesia, for example, or the west coast of the States, they experience earthquakes all the time, and that's not an issue. Uh, but the project uh, that was run by Von Roche had to be shut down because of local damage. When people dig deeper into geothermal energy, they, they also consider that it's expensive and time consuming, particularly if you talk to the people who finance the projects. Um, the open loop scenarios require a great deal of planning. They need, as I've mentioned, this nuanced geology. They need to be able to drill two wells and for those wells to be uh, connected through geology at depth. Um, the audience here will be aware of the complexities of the subsurface. Um, and indeed, the amount of modeling, if you look at the oil and gas scenario, you spend a long, long time doing the basin analysis before you actually choose a well location. And it's not too different in the open loop geothermal scenario. If you don't have that connectivity, you don't have a successful project. So because of that, the, the, the lead times for act before drilling are very, very long and, uh, and expensive. Um, there is a risk, again, if you ask financiers into geothermal energy about risk, they will all tell you that um, project failure is a massive risk. I've already mentioned project failure due to um, what I refer to as seismic hooliganism, but there's also project failure due to lack of communication between wells. And depending on the type of geothermal environment um, and who you speak to, you'll hear that the failure rate of geothermal um, open loop projects is between 10 and 25% of the time. Uh, bearing all of these perceptions in mind, um, I have come up with this equation, maybe not that scientific, uh, but the conventional or open loop geothermal is equal to volcanoes, hooliganism, uh, expense and risk. Uh, so I've, I've talked about the negative sides of geothermal. Um, I would like to spend more time speaking about the upside because the upsides of geothermal are uh, absolutely huge. Um, the first and perhaps most important thing is that it's a baseload green energy. Now, if you look at wind, uh, offshore wind, I'm on the south south coast of England. I can see the um, the Rampion wind farm from my office window. Um, the the wind farm there has a 40% efficacy. So. If a turbine is built and they say it can it can generate uh, 10 megawatts uh, of electricity, it's actually only through its lifetime going to be averaging four megawatts uh, because of the fact that the wind just doesn't blow all the time. Um, there are periods in England during the summer where we have weeks, if not months, of uh, of still weather, and and these uh, these wind farms are are therefore useless. Conversely, um, if it's not sunny, then, then solar fields uh, don't work either. Uh, whereas, of course, uh, geothermal, once the well is drilled, it's baseload 24-7, 365. The off-grid nature of, uh, of geothermal, in fact, most, um, most renewable energies is definitely an upside. Um, the little Cheat notes I put here. I remember Texas, and the, way, the reason I say I remember Texas is that two years ago in February, um, there were some severe snowstorms, uh, which obliterated the infrastructure in Texas, and as a result, there were lots of people without power, 
and that resulted in loss of life. Um, quite a, a serious situation, of course. Um, re relying on microgrids or small grids is definitely a benefit. Um, uh, Andy, sorry, yes. are you yeah. sharing the slides now? Can you not see my, my slides? We, we did, and I think the last slide, uh, it just... Uh, okay. It, 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 there was, uh, where you started uh, speaking about the positives, I think maybe you... Let me try again. Can, can you see this? Yes, yes, yeah, we can see it. Excellent. I'll, uh, I'll try and get back to it. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. So, um, yeah, the... The off-grid nature is, is also uh, a very valuable part of geothermal energy. Uh, energy security is something that's come up in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, um, particularly associated with increasing gas and oil prices. And um, we've seen uh, a situation in Europe in, in particular where our energy prices have increased uh, incredibly uh, quickly and in some cases, it's been unaffordable for individuals to heat their houses. Um, once you have drilled a geothermal uh, well or sequence of wells, you have a uh, purchase agreement for the energy in place. And that price is not going to change based on regional or global energy um, prices. So it's fixed. Um, and that provides you and your town, your city, your industry with, uh, with energy security. Geothermal is also one of the only industries that doesn't use uh, exotic minerals, rare earths uh, in its general processes. It's, um, if you look at, for example, uh, solar and wind, they both, they both use these, um, these exotic minerals and everyone's seen the picture of um, of children mining in the Congo. There's also a carbon footprint, of course, uh, associated with shipping those rare earths from the, from the corners of the, uh, of the world. Um, geothermal energy can be a great island solution. It's um, because it can be useful anywhere. Um, we can, for example, drill, drill a well in a remote location or on an island. The energy can be used for electricity, of course, but also desalination or water treatment, um, which means that effectively, if you wanted to, you could drill a hole in the middle of the desert, um, as long as you have a um, some kind of um, brine aquifer, you can you can use that for desalination and you can have fresh water in the desert. Um, in the cases of closed loop, there is a consider, considerable reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, depending on which solution you look at, um, because some of them actually have an open loop element to them, um, open loop geothermal uh, can have some quite nasty gases and minerals coming to surface, but closed loop actually doesn't have any in most cases. Um, and because of that, then we have a clean energy with zero energy emissions uh, during production. It's also scalable. Um, so in the case of Seraphy, we can uh, look at a project which, I mean, here I've put one megawatt to 100 megawatts, but we can actually provide facilities that are even less than a megawatt if, if that is your limited demand. Um, so that's something that uh, is, is also very useful. Are we talking to um, partners who are looking at, uh, for example, drilling a very shallow geothermal well, not quite ground source heat pump, but not very deep, in order to heat a leisure facility's uh, swimming pool. Um, but on the other side of things, we're talking to companies who are interested in electricity and drilling uh, potentially dozens of very, very deep um, oil and gas style wells. So the, the scalability is definitely a, a selling point and a, de a definite asset. Um, we have a very small footprint compared to uh, wind and solar and other renewable energies. Um, if you've seen pictures of solar farms that basically cover 
the, the ground all the way to the horizon, it can be quite a daunting prospect. Um, in geothermal, our well pads are the same as oil and gas. Um, so using modern um, high-tech land rigs, that footprint may only be 75 by 45 or 50 meters. Um, when we finish drilling, the footprint shrinks considerably to maybe 25 meters by 25 meters. Um, and we can actually even house our energy facility and our wellheads under the ground. Uh, so you can make it completely invisible if necessary. Um, for example, that's a great application for national parks. Um, something that I particularly like is using uh, geothermal uh, directly for heating and cooling. It's, it creates more energy efficiency. It means that every uh, megawatt of energy that we produce goes further, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a while. We can provide heating for glasshouse projects or, or aquaculture, perhaps, uh, which provides food security. Uh, if you look at Iceland, for example, they have glasshouse projects, um, a very small, by relatively speaking, 11,000 square meters of uh, glasshouse in, um, in Iceland provides 40% of the country's tomatoes. They even grow wasabi in Iceland in glasshouses. So there's, there's an agricultural um, uh, element as well. When we generate electricity, you can, you can create pure green hydrogen. And one of the things that I like about, um, about what we do at Seraphy is that we take uh, and create employment uh, everywhere we go. Uh, our estimate is that there are five jobs per megawatt of energy created. So uh, looking a little bit about what we use energy for, uh, and this is something I touched on just now, in the UK, for example, um, more than 50% of our household energy is used for heating spaces uh, and water. If you look at the Middle East, they use 70% uh, in some countries of their electricity to, uh, to air condition their, their buildings. So, and then you also look at uh, industrial use of uh, of direct heat and cooling. Uh, it's used for all of these different things for driving, uh, to drying, cooking, washing, sterilizing, uh, brewing, for example. Uh, the list goes on and on. Um, so the question that we ask is why transport uh, electricity over great distances just to convert it into heating and cooling when you could potentially just use the heat that you're standing on. So going back to the perceptions uh, of geothermal and telling you how the new technologies um, have created a new reality about that uh, rather scary equation. Uh, first of all, living next to a volcano, if you look at the map here, on uh, the right hand side of the image, you will see a geothermal map created by the BGS of the, uh, of the UK, uh, Great Britain actually. Um, it's a map of temperatures at one kilometer. Um, to put this into perspective, uh, the average geothermal gradient in the UK is, is just over average globally. Uh, the global average is 30 degrees Celsius per kilometre. Um, everywhere blue on this map is less than 30 degrees Celsius. So there are small pockets here and there. Um, 30 degrees Celsius is the cutoff that we use at Serafi for electricity generation. This is 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So uh, we need a wellhead temperature that is favorable. Um, in the case of our technology, we look for always over 100 degrees Celsius at the wellhead, preferably more than 120 degrees Celsius. So if you look at, for example, um, where I live, I live uh, on the very south of this, this, um, this map, um, just within view of the Isle of Man uh, on, on the beach. And the geothermal gradient where I live is somewhere in the region of 40 to 50 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, that's a lot. 
if you consider that we can drill a three kilometer well in my back garden, which would provide a total depth temperature of 150 degrees Celsius potentially, um, and maybe get us 120 degrees Celsius at the surface, then I could generate electricity from that well. And that is nothing to do with specific geology. It is just by tapping into, um, into the heat from, from the rocks. Um, so the places that we can't generate electricity, we can still use direct heat. So effectively, anywhere on this map of the UK, we can drill a geothermal well and take um, heat to the surface and use that for one of those direct heating um, applications. New technologies are not uh, responsible for seismic hooliganism, purely because of the fact that closed loop geothermal does not inject into the subsurface. Um, as a result, we don't require fracking. Um, we, don't, we don't require um, any injection of water at all, which means no induced faults or no pressure and temperature changes, which means no um, secondary seismic activity. In the case of um, Seraphie Well, I can't really speak too much for our competitors, um, but the, uh, the Seraphie Well requires a very simple planning process. We don't need reservoirs. We don't have very, very technical um, drilling plans. We effectively need to drill a well as safely as possible to, uh, to the pre-designated depth. And that's something that requires a relatively short planning time. Um, and there is no associated expense um, when you look at, for example, basin analysis. Uh, there, is no, uh, there is no joining up of wells required. So we don't need that extensive planning process. Um, you should also bear in mind that we only need to drill a single well as opposed to two or multiple wells. Uh, the, the risky aspect of the equation um, due to subsurface communication failure between wells is something that we also negate because quite simply we don't require it. Uh, we drill, drill single wells which are cased off and as a result they will not ever fail due to lack of communication between wells. Uh, so going back to the equation, what's the solution? Uh, you'll all be incredibly surprised to say I think the solution is Seraphi Energy. Um, we are a closed loop geothermal company. Uh, we've married oil and gas and geothermal uh, with a sprinkling of ground source heat pump um, technology and modeling uh, and come up with a solution that solves all of the uh, all of the negative aspects of traditional geothermal um, energy. In essence, what we do is enable organizations to achieve net zero targets using our baseload geothermal solutions. And we do that um, using something that we call a Seraphy well. Um, there are two columns in this, uh, this diagram, and one says drilling phase and the other one says repurposing phase. I will talk a little bit about repurposing um, later. Um, but in essence, this uh, particular diagram is a depiction of our single well solution. We pump a um, working fluid, and that fluid can be anything of our choice, around a closed loop solution. Um, the system is coaxial, so you can pump the fluid down the outside um, of the, uh, the central pipe still within a cased hole. Uh, the solution uh, transports the, the cold fluid down the well. Uh, we have a um, completion design which enhances the amount of energy that we can get from surrounding rocks um, and its, its efficiency of being transported to the surface. So that fluid is then transported up the center of this coaxial pipe to the surface where we use heat exchangers to take that heat from the wellhead and uh, turn it into either electricity or direct heat use. Uh, this particular schematic is showing uh, a six kilometer TD uh, and 180 degrees Celsius. 
And the, the reason for that is that it's the global average. As I've already mentioned, we can achieve 150 degrees Celsius where I am today uh, from wells of between three and four kilometers. Uh, so it very, it's very much a case of looking at the particular geothermal gradients of the location, uh, but we are not bound by the particular rock type. So just going through a comparison of the open loop uh, traditional uh, geothermal systems and uh, I'm not saying closed loop, I'm, I'm specifically saying Seraphy well because some of the uh, some of the geothermal uh, closed loop uh, solutions are really quite different to the solution that Seraphy uh, produces. So I can only speak about the, the solution that we specifically provide. Um, so the first thing that you'll notice about the diagram I showed you earlier on is that the uh, the open loop situation is is generally uh, deviated, has to be because they're drilling two wells from the same location and they need to have some kind of division in order to uh, to be able to have some transit time in the subsurface. Uh, and as a result, they are greater measured depth. I've already discussed the high exploration risk associated with um, the open loop uh, solution. I say high. Some people may consider a 10 to 25 percent um, failure rate not particularly high, but at Seraphy, we don't have failure due to lack of subsurface communication. Um, so we have an incredibly low risk. The risk associated with our wells will be drilling. Um, and in, in cases where we're not actually drilling new wells, where we, we're repurposing old wells, um, then the, the, uh, the risk is obviously indicated further. Open loop scenarios require stimulation, fracking, whereas uh, in the particular case of Seraphy, we will never do fracking or, res or reservoir uh, or rock stimulation. There are other closed loop companies uh, like Green Forest, for example, who do fracking. In some countries like the UK, for example, that process is banned anyway. Um, if an open loop project fails, the, the entire, the, if it, due to lack of communication, the entire project fails. Um, and that's an expensive um, um, problem to have. Uh, and to my my thinking is this failure of open loop solutions is the major and perhaps the only cause um, of geothermal performing so badly in the, the global energy markets. Um, nobody wants to finance a project which might not work. Um, if you look at Seraphy, we can take those failed open loop wells and retrofit them with our our, um, our Seraphy well and basically solve solve that uh, failure solution. Um, of course, you require a reservoir of some kind in uh, open loop scenario, whether it's a hydrothermal um, sedimentary reservoir in the case of Munich, or if, if it's a uh, enhanced geothermal project uh, like the ones uh, trying to find ge uh, geothermal energy in Cornwall in England. Um, Seraphy, we don't require a reservoir, we're just looking uh, to gather heat through conduction. Um, there's a very high running cost of open loop solutions uh, because of the fact that they need to pump huge amounts of water uh, into the subsurface. Water is a scarce resource and becoming more scarce as time goes by. They also have to um, manage the waste that comes to the surface with the water that they liberate. At Seraphy, we pump a closed loop fluid um, around a closed well, and the expense associated with our uh, solutions running costs are basically enough energy to, um, to, to provide electricity for a pump. Um, and we will always endeavor to get the energy from uh, renewable energy sources. The lifespan of uh, open loop wells is 20 to 30 years, um, longer if they're lucky. Um, it's kind of similar to an oil, oil and gas well. They have scaling problems. They have uh, corrosion, corrosion problems due to the high temperatures and toxicity, toxicity of some of the fluids. Um, so corrosion is a big problem. That's not something that we experience in closed loop, um, particularly the Seraphy well. We think we have a very, very long well life. We don't know how long yet. Uh, my guess is somewhere between 100, uh, between 50 and 100 years. As you can see, uh, this 
this kind of this list um, is quite complex when it comes to open loop and quite simple when it comes to closed loop. Um, the Serafy well solution is uh, is something that is a very very simple solution. Um, it's commercial proof uh, for the reasons that I've just discussed. Discussed no fracking. We can retrofit failed um, geothermal wells and depleted oil and gas wells. Um, we don't require a reservoir. We have low running costs and we have expend, extended land, um, well lives. And something here um, that I mentioned is abandonment deferral. And this is talking about repurposing of oil and gas wells. Um, this is potentially my favorite slide. Um, the reason for that is that these two uh, oil wells are in Texas. And the building behind them is, uh, I'm reliably informed, a, uh, an oil museum. And um, these wells are probably producing 100 barrels of oil a day. Um, and they will do for X years. But at some point, they will stop producing. When that happens, you can take these nodding donkeys away, you can remove the oil and gas uh, completion, and you can insert a seraphy well completion, and you can generate heat. That's guaranteed. You can generate heat from these wells. And the heat could be used, potentially, to heat the oil museum in the background. Um, it could also be used um, for agricultural purposes, uh, it can be used for heating local buildings or if there's an indus industrial building nearby, then it could be used for uh, any direct industrial application. Um, at Serafi, we are looking at wells in Louisiana at the moment. They have, they have um, total depth temperatures in excess of 150 degrees Celsius, and we can actually use those wells uh, to generate electricity. In the case of those wells, they are absolutely in the middle of nowhere and there is no um, direct access to the grid even. Um, but in that particular scenario, we can use the electricity from these uh, end of life wells to um, generate electricity and Bitcoin mine, um, because of course there are solutions, energy uses like Bitcoin mining, which are off grid. So we can therefore repurpose just about any accessible oil and gas well. Um, we always look for onshore, but we can use that for uh, district heating and cooling, for agriculture, industrial use, electricity, green hydrogen, et cetera. Um, at Serafi, we're finding that we're getting a great deal of uh, attention from oil and gas. And at the moment, it looks, about, it looks as if about 70% of our work is going to be repurposing existing wells, mainly oil and gas wells. So in summary, um, Serafi Energy has the ability to drill new wells or to repurpose existing wells. Um, we can uh, do that by using direct heat from very low temperatures, um, or we can uh, use deeper wells, higher temperatures uh, to generate electricity. We can use the energy for water treatment, desalination, direct industrial use, um, electricity generation, um, we can use it for green hydrogen, agricultural purposes, and for residential and district heating. Um, and the thing I, I like about it always is the fact that it brings employment with it. Um, so going back to the equation of conventional geothermal being equal to volcanoes, hooliganism, expense and risk, Seraphy energy is anywhere. It's because it's not dependent on geology, it's discrete, uh, with a small footprint, uh, no earthquakes. It's competitively priced um, based on uh, on current figures uh, and it's low risk. We won't have failure due to lack of communication. Uh, so to simplify that equation further, in my, in my view, Seraphy Energy is energy solved. And the reason that they're calling the 2020s the geothermal decade 
is because of the new technologies coming through from companies like Evor and Greenfire and, and Criterion, uh, Fervo, et cetera. Um, and as a result, the geothermal energy is growing and growing. Thank you very much for your time. Um, if anybody would like to reach out to me, then please feel free to do so. Andy.wood at seraphie.com. Um, LinkedIn is also a very good way of getting in touch with me. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Sandy, for the great uh, presentation. I think we all obviously enjoyed it. It was a great, uh, great um, introduction actually to the closed loops um, systems. Um, so I think now I can open up the question and answer uh, or the discussion part of the event. So everyone is welcome to to turn their cameras on and uh, their unmute their speakers. You can ask the question directly to Andy, I think, which uh, I think would be nice to um, to do if, if you uh, if you would like or we have obviously a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I don't know. So the, I think the best would be Arthur, maybe you would you like to ask your question yourself? Uh, let's let's just start with you. Um, or sh should it, yeah. Yeah, I can ask. Uh, hello, Andy. Artyom is here, and I, I have a question about the depletion. So, uh, if we are uh, uh, taking energy from underneath, then do we need to recharge it on an annual basis, like take energy in winter and put it back in summer? Or what will happen if we do not recharge? For how long? we can expect this uh, heat generator to last? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. That's, that's a great question, Artem. Thank you. And of course, it, it's very important. Um, yes, of course, if you if you take heat from one area, then the, the heat in that area is going to deplete. Um, so what we've done um, is we have uh, built a software package called Seraphy Pro, and that software package draws on a combination of uh, ground source heat pump, pump modeling, which is proven, tried and tested. Um, we basically upscaled that and we've mixed it with reservoir engineering from, engineering from oil and gas. And we will basically model the, the rate of depletion based on the, the rate at which we pump the fluid around our wells. Um, and this is something that is, it's pure maths and physics. I would love to explain it to you, but I can't. Um, but if, if you if you speak to uh, guys who've worked in ground source heat pumps for a long time, they are basically physicists or mathematicians, and and they look at conduction of various different rocks, which is where we come in. We we provide ge geological input, so we know the rate at which the heat will be transferred from the well to uh, beg your pardon from the rocks to the well. We can adjust the flow rates in our wells to optimize the heat production over decades. So as part of our output, we will provide a graph, a seasonal graph, um, split into summer and winter, that shows you over decades the, the gradual depletion of heat um, over time. And we can adjust that depletion based on the rate at which we pump fluids through our wells. If you start getting a bit technical, you can, for example, uh, have a bilateral well where you have um, two legs and you can produce from this. If, if you particularly want a, a more accelerated production, you can have um, a bilateral well. You, pr you produce from one uh, leg of the well for a few months and then the second leg for a few months and then the heat gets to regenerate. Uh, but it's a very important question. So thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for a nice talk. Thank you, Artem. And then we have a few questions from Soraya. Thank you. You have uh, obviously uh, have have been uh, posting a few few questions. So would you like to ask some of them yourself? Yeah. Hello, Andy. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, actually, my questions are related to the previous question. Like, I saw that there are like some startups like XJS Energy, who's also developing a closed loop system that are actually 
injecting in into the rock like um, like a, a conductive material to increase the, the the conductivity and to have like much more efficient um, yeah production. So do you think that's that's something that is necessary like at some point when you want to reach much higher powers or or do you think it's just you know what do you think about that? Um, we will, we will look at optimization. As I've mentioned, the last half of my career in oil and gas was all, all about operational optimization. So we look at every single aspect of optimizing what we do. Um, as I've already mentioned, therapy doesn't inject anything into the subsurface. But we will, for example, look at um, cements to cement our casing in place, uh, which have greater conductivity to optimize the heat flow from the rock to, to the well. Um, and we also look at optimization through the different working fluids that we can put in our wells. Um, so because it's closed loop, we can use anything we like. Um, okay. we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing research and development with, uh, with three or four universities in the UK. Um, and one of those uh, relationships is looking at optimizing the, the fluid that we use in order to be able to maximize the temperature that we get to surface. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Uh, yeah, that answered it a bit. I actually have a tiny other question that is related. So what's the, um, let's say, the maximum power that you think you can generate from one of those wells, for example, that you drill at, I don't know, uh, 100, at a depth of 180 degrees, just like as an order of magnitude? Um, it depends on the depth of the well. Um, so if if we look at... Um, my back garden in, in England. Um, as I've mentioned, okay, so let's say it's 180 degrees, that's about five kilometers, let's say, where I am. Uh, we could hope to get maybe 140 of those at surface. Uh, we would plug that uh, through a heat exchanger into a, a, an organic Rankine cycle um, solution. And this is a solution that we use today. Um, that we would use today um, because there are new technologies coming in all the time. But I anticipate that that, that well would bring, let's say, somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 megawatts of heat to the surface. Okay. Um, and that's if you want to convert that to electricity, which I personally don't like the idea of because it's inefficient. Organic rank ranking cycles can be a good one, maybe 10 percent efficient. So if you have 10 to 15 megawatts of heat, you're going to generate one to one and a half megawatts of electricity. But as I say, that to me, that's a waste. It's 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 mm. it's you it's losing energy. And as everyone watching this knows, we need as much energy as we can get. There are situations where it's in, it's essential to have electricity, and and a closed loop geothermal uh, solution will answer that problem. There are also solution uh, there are also situations where it's very very expensive due to the remoteness of locations to generate electricity. Um, and for example, um, I don't know, islands in the middle of nowhere. Um, but yeah, so I, I, the, the temperatures, the temp temperatures um, will dictate the, the depth of the wells effectively. If you look at the, the Southern Caribbean, their geothermal gradients are 100 degrees Celsius per kilometer. You just need a two kilometer well and you can generate a lot of electricity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Surai. Thank you, Andy, for answer. It's uh, great. It's great to have uh, someone so curious. Uh, so thanks for actually having a, having prepared a few questions during the presentation. Then we have another question from did, did, did it actually, sorry, did it answer? You had some more more things you wanted to to ask. I think on my side, I'm fine. It's, uh, they were all related, actually, my questions. So you answered it like in the previous question and uh, now it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. So next question we have from Emilio. I don't know if you can. Uh, okay, I will maybe read it out. What is the greatest challenge for geothermal energy to gain 
background to have an important place in the debates, public opinion, technical and political challenges? Well, that's that's a great question. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the, the biggest obstacle that we face uh, is awareness. Um, we are doing all we can and, uh, and, and we are gaining a lot of ground. Um, I'm fundamentally impatient, so nothing ever moves fast enough for me, but I, I can see the solution that we have and I know it works. Our, our first demonstration uh, from Serafi, uh, our first working well, um, is going to have boots on the ground next month, maybe July, but probably next month. And then we will have a working well which produces heat uh, at surface. And that is going to be a big step for us. Um, and that will help us spread awareness. Me talking to you today, I hope, spreads awareness. Uh, and I hope that everyone listening to this will, will uh, go home and speak about the magic of closed loop geothermal. Um, but it's, it's, it's the number one obstacle because what we do, what, what uh, Evo does, what all of those other new closed loop companies do, and to, and to a large degree as well, the open loop companies, um, if they are in a lucky enough position to, to be in one of those favorable environments, geothermal energy has so much to provide, um, but it really, really hasn't been given enough of a chance. And now is the time, this geothermal decade of the 2020s, um, is actually, it's beginning to create that awareness. If you look at Houston, for example, last week, there was a big geothermal show there. The organizers of that show are organizing another one in uh, Berlin at the end of this year. Um, and those shows are based on oil and gas meets geothermal. And, and to me, oil and gas will help um, spread, spread the word because oil and gas is always looking for what they can do with their wells. And that, that um, elegant solution of taking a well that's already been drilled and just converting it into a geothermal well is also gonna help spread the awareness. So I, 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 think, I think that's the biggest obstacle. In some countries, um, regulators can, can kind of get under your feet or get in the way, um, but that changes very much from region to region and country to country. Um, but really, Awareness is the key. Thank you, Andy. I hope that answers Emilia's question. We have another question from Polly. I don't know if you would like to turn on your mic or uh, would you prefer that I read out your question? I mean, if you can speak, feel free to speak. OK. No problem, no, I can read it out. Okay, so the question is, do you think oil and gas companies will use repurposing wells to, uh, to geothermal as a way to avoid or defeat the, com the, the fair, sorry, the fair decommissioning obligations? It might help, uh, help to, it might help uh, to accelerate take, uh, or take up of the geothermal. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, a, a resounding yes is the answer to that that question. Um, I'm not quite sure how many people in the audience are from oil and gas, but once you have finished producing uh, from an oil and gas well, there is a hefty price tag associated with decommissioning that well. Uh, we call it the abandonment cost. And those abandonment costs can be, I don't know, anything from half a million dollars to a million and a half dollars, depending on where the well is and uh, its intricacy. Um, that money uh, is a liability. It, it's it's set aside, usually, hopefully, by the oil and gas company to abandon that well and to do to do the right thing, basically to make the site as it was um, and, and not interfere with the environment, etc. Um, by converting that well into a geothermal well, you take your liability and you turn it into an asset. So the liability disappears um, or is kicked 40 or 50 years down the road um, and it turns into a geothermal energy producer. As I've mentioned, we've looked at wells in Louisiana that actually can produce electricity. Um, if not, I mean, our, our first project in the UK 
uh, that's going to happen um, in a couple of months is uh, taking energy from a well which was drilled for fracking. It was never fracked because there's a moratorium in the UK. Um, and we are going to use that heat uh, potentially for a, a, in the long term for a rum distillery. Um, and of course, that means that that well will not have to be um, abandoned. And that is a huge asset to the company who owns the well. Yes, I think that that definitely is is a good point because in especially in North Sea, I mean, a lot of the work is uh, abandonment. So if you could save the cost uh, for that, that obviously would be a, a great um, help. And there is a comment from Scott. I don't know if you can speak or again I can read it out. So um, Scott just commented a big problem in many you. US states in or or fun oil wells which need to be um, abundant at the moment it has to be paid by state or federal tax payer funds yeah. if those wells can be used to generate cash now it can ultimately pay for the uh, plug in and abandonment of the well so yeah that is that's, that's true and uh, there are actually companies um, who specialize in abandoning those oil and, oil and gas wells onshore US, um, and they're paid to do that by the government. But so, and not all of those wells will be in good enough condition. They may be absolutely uh, degraded and, um, and not accessible. Um, but for example, a company might go to a lease where they have 10 wells, um, they'll plug and abandon uh, half of those, and the other half might be accessible and useful for geothermal energy. Those can be converted to geothermal producers. Half of the wells will be paid for by the government. The other half they can gain energy from and uh, use it for all those direct purposes that I've mentioned. OK, in, in terms of initiatives uh, from the government, uh, let's say, well, in you, your case, you're in, based in the UK, so Let's say, is there any initiatives from the UK government to um, favour geothermal uh, the development instead of uh, just the abandonment? Uh, the UK government is is certainly trying to persuade um, green applications for wells. Um, there's a great deal of focus on carbon capture. Uh, there is there is support for geothermal energy. Um, Serapi has benefited benefited from um, two grants from the the UK government via the Net Zero Technology Centre. The first one was to perform a study um, of the North Sea and specifically Inquest's Magnus platform to look at the potential of geothermal energy generation on that platform. Um, and its potential applications. And the second funding that we received was uh, towards our demonstration project, which is, uh, as I've already mentioned, is about to happen. Um, and that funding will be used to help us repurpose an existing well. Um, but a long time ago, probably 18 months ago, we identified that the States would be our major market. So yes, we are a UK based company, but we, off, uh, we opened an office at Greentown Labs in Houston 18 months ago. Uh, we have full-time staff there. Um, and we can see that the 1 million plus wells uh, that sit in and around Texas uh, are going to be excellent candidates for the work that we do. Um, orphan wells have been mentioned, but also that uh, that kicking the abandonment can down the road is something that the American oil and gas companies are very interested in. And of course, there is funding from the government. Uh, I'm sure that most people have heard about the uh, the Biden um, tax levies that are, are being um, used to, to help alternative energy companies. OK, no, that, that makes sense. But in terms of development in Europe, so uh, one is UK and let's say the development, well, we are I'm in, in France, so 
do you think that uh, you, do you see actually that uh, let's say based on if the project that you're doing that you could also increase the similar projects across the Europe because you said of, of course the focus is Houston uh, which I believe is uh, just that there's in general more operations and more well drilled but do you see increase uh, in Europe as well in uh, the geothermal uh, uh, yeah, projects? It's, yeah it's already happening um, we, we talk to um, potential partners new partners every day um, from everywhere globally but many of those are in Europe we've we've looked at just about every European country you could name um, including France um, so there are potential projects or we'll have a company that will come to us who for example they may own an industrial facility that has um, plants in 10 European countries and they'll come to us and say can you help us decarbonize our operation? And of course, the answer is yes. Do you need heat? Yes, we can help. Doesn't matter where you are. Okay, thank you. And there is a question from Dr. Malcolm Francis. Uh, so the cost of drilling increases exponentially with the depths of the temperature uh, increase, increases linearly. So how do you balance the cost? So it's about the cost versus the. Um, okay, well, I, I, would, I would take exception to that statement. It's not it's not an exponential increase in drilling costs. Um, there is an increase in cost with depth because you're drilling uh, you're drilling deeper. It's taking more time. You have to pay for rigs and uh, equipment and people. Um, but yes, there 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 is an increase in cost with depth, uh, which all needs to be budgeted, but. This is where oil and gas uh, comes to the fore in what we do, because there are new oil and gas technologies. There are bit companies who can design bits that work magic. There are, are companies who will design um, downhole hammers, which will help you increase rates of penetration, which means that, um, yes, the deeper you go, um, then effectively, because you're spending more days, you're taking more time. But if you can reduce your drilling time by using clever equipment, then you can optimize that process. Um, and it's something that I've done in oil and gas. It's something that so many people have done in oil and gas. And why not just apply that to geothermal? It's very strange that so many geothermal companies don't use cutting edge oil and gas technology in order to shorten their drilling times because that's the most expensive part of what they do. Yes, it might be just that the expertise could be different from, uh, I guess, depending on, on the company that maybe that's why not uh, maybe some of the companies, they don't have this uh, this background. Did that answer your question, Dr. Malcolm? I hope, I hope. Uh, I, if it I, I think uh, you, you're touching on a point there, which is we need the drilling technology to improve. Um, there are certain advantages if you're drilling for geothermal because you can choose rocks that are easier to drill, whereas in the oil and gas industry, you have to drill the rocks that are between you and the oil and gas. Um, so for example, down in Cornwall where they're drilling granites, there are less problems per meter or whatever, but of course it's a very hard rock. So it, it again, it costs a lot to to drill just based on the rig time. Yeah, and what I, I noticed there was the drilling seemed incredibly inefficient. It, you know, they they had a rig for a very long time to drill the wells, and if we're going to um, make progress, one of the lessons we've learned is that the exploration wells in oil and gas are very expensive, and then the production wells just come down well by well. So as we get used to drilling in a particular location, we get the price down and down and down. And I think that will be one of the big issues. I, I, I do worry about having a single well because of the heat flow equations involved. You know, the the amount of heat you can move from the rock into the well as a function of the cross-sectional area of the interior of the well. So, you know, that 
if if you're after a well that will last for a very long time, yes, you you don't want to take too much heat per day or or whatever. But yes, that, that's where the optimization process comes in. Uh, but you, you you've raised a, a few points there, um, and and perhaps the, the the most important one to begin with, um, you mentioned the project in Cornwall. The project in Cornwall. Um, for a reason unknown to me, only employed use of uh, of rock bits, trichome bits. Uh, those were invented by Howard Hughes. They're very, very, very old technology. Um, for, they didn't employ op, uh, oil and gas optimization processes at all. Uh, that's why it's one of the reasons that the the uh, drilling took so long. They actually used a very good rig, uh, but but they didn't employ the, the most uh, up to date processes or tools. Um, secondly, the way that we work in in the anywhere solution in, in, in therapy energy is we wait for people to come to us when it comes to uh, energy. We don't specifically choose targets which um, have favourable drilling conditions. We have someone comes comes to us to say, I have a brewery and I to drill a well in our car park to give me 90 degrees Celsius at surface. Um, so that's what we do, and we drill through the rocks that are there. But there is no rock in place that is going to be that difficult to drill um, that you can't uh, mitigate with modern oil and gas technology. Specifically, um, the rock hammers and the PDC bits, particular modern PDC bits, um, will will make light work, for example, of, of the granite in Cornwall. I hope that answers Malcolm's, uh, Dr. Malcolm's question. I, I think it, it, yeah. it, it certainly is an issue of getting the drilling technology up to, to speed for the, the rock type you're working on. I agree about the PDC and um, hammers and so on. That, that, that was a technology that I used in Cornwall and it significantly improved the drilling rates on shallow wells, but um, what happens on the deep well is mainly the cost associated with problems that you meet on the way down. So with sedimentary rocks, you often just run into problems of pressure and, and uh, collapse of boreholes and having to case and all the rest of it. In igneous rocks, you have less of a problem because there's no porosity to transmit that pressure into the well bore. Yeah, this this is where this is where oil and gas uh, comes to the rescue again. Uh, somewhere in the region of 20 million wells have been drilled globally in oil and gas. We are used to drilling sediments, uh, so we do we do all of the the uh, the planning work that is sufficient to give you pressure prediction, um, which will tell you where you can put your casing, and as a result, the well will be will be drilled in an optimum design. So it really is a case of of doing your due, your due diligence and making sure that you use the right tools for the for the job. Uh, can I ask another question? Yes, yes, go for it. Yes. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with the different drilling tools, but. Uh, Aren't the drilling technologies used for oil and gas a bit too expensive for uh, for geothermal? Like how? Like <clears throat> that's that's um, a good question, and uh, you have to look at the benefits of the costs. Um, if, for example, rather than taking six months to drill a well, I only take three, um, but I, and I'm employing a, a tool that costs me ten thousand dollars a day to do that. But the rig is costing me seventy thousand dollars a day. It's worthwhile. So you have you have to look at at the, the the benefits of using that technology, and within oil in the in gas and with ge within geothermal, drilling is expensive, and you need to basically reduce the time you spend doing everything with a drilling rig, um, and that 
That includes um, time you take to put the, the pipe in and out of the hole by using perhaps more efficient rigs, um, time you take to drill, time you take to run casing. And there are so many ways and so many really, really helpful oil and gas people who can help us with that. Okay, yeah, thank you. And there's uh, Scott has raised his uh, his uh, his hand. Yes, I mean yes. Andy's mentioned about technology transfer, and um, full disclosure, I'm I'm actually a, a drilling sort of super senior drilling engineer. I've got decades of experience, and one of the things that uh, during the the COVID lockdown, I attended quite a lot of webinars both on the geothermal side of things and also on the uh, looking at the, the wind uh, power side of things and it always struck me about how little crossover there was between the expertise that's available in the oil and gas industry and the expertise that is needed in the renewable industry um, so for example specifically on geothermal um, i remember attending one webinar where uh, there was a, a researcher who was spending a lot of money in developing a system where they ran when when the casing was run, they ran a fiber optic cable down the outside of the casing um, to identify how good the cement was after the cement job. Well, in the oil and gas industry, we've got years and years and years of experience of running an electric log after you've run the casing to actually identify where the cement is and, and how good it is much more simple, much cheaper, uh, and much more cost effective. And as Andy touched on, um, I did read a couple of papers or, or a couple of small articles about the, the geothermal working corner. Again, I was, I was astonished that, yes, they used an extremely good rig, but as Andy mentioned, the techniques they were using, it's like for a drilling person, it's like almost out the Stone Age. Um, so there's certainly a lot of, uh, lot of room for technology transfer and um, uh, uh, and, and you know somebody like myself, you know, I've actually been in touch with Andy. He mentioned LinkedIn, and it's a very good good uh, platform. You know, we've been in touch for a couple of years on that, and I'm actually going to be doing some work for Serify, or hopefully doing some work for Serify, <laughs> in terms of okay, you've got a disused oil and gas well here. How can we convert that into a usable borehole for for geothermal? And it's it's not something that a lot of people appreciate. It's just how many onshore wells are around. You know, Andy mentioned there's a million in, in uh, basically in Texas. There's 4,000 onshore wells in the UK, which people don't, a lot of people don't recognize. So there's a huge resource there that, uh, that can be used to generate baseline power. And that is something that I think is becoming more and more prevalent in terms of thinking is we need a reliable baseline power. Um, so, so for example, I, I assume there's, there's a similar uh, system available in France, but in the UK, um, our, uh, our national grid provider, they produce uh, a, a website, actually, I, I think I can paste it up here. Um, and what that does is it shows the percentage of renewable energy, the percentage of fossil fuel energy, the percentage of, of uh, uh, nuclear power that's being available. But interestingly, it also shows the current cost and the current availability. Um, and at the moment, we've reached a stage where, like for example, in the UK over this weekend, um, it was unusually, it was quite, it was very sunny, it was very windy, and of course it's a bank holiday weekend. So the, the effect was that there was actually more energy that we can use, and there was large periods of time uh, over this weekend through the interconnectors between France, Belgium, the Netherlands and, uh, and Norway, Europe was actually paying us to take their excess, excess electricity. Well, at the moment, that's obviously a waste. Um, and there's, there's a lot more uses that, that that can be put to, but it, it does show that there's a, 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 you reach a point with renewable energy, with, with unreliable new, 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 new renewable energy, where you need to be able to take that excess power and convert it into something more useful. Well, that significantly adds to the cost, whereas with geothermal, you get the base uh, power load and it's, it's reliable and it's predictable 24-7. Um, and that, that's something that we need to, to focus, on, focus on more to help the, uh, help the transition to, to renewable energy. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know about overseas, but I think that's something that you know, people in the UK are becoming more aware of because of you know, what happened over the over the winter with uh, as a result of um, 
uh, Putin invading Ukraine. Yeah, I, I think I think the energy security question has come to the fore, certainly over the last uh, 12 months, uh, but particularly, as you mentioned, Scott, over the winter. Um, and it it's possibly why one of the reasons that uh, the therapy has uh, had a lot more uh, attention uh, over the winter and and and, and continued to do so. Um, the idea that that you can have an energy source which is there all of the time is certainly that uh, asset cost is something that uh, that most people find very attractive. Thank you for uh, the discussion. It's it is that uh, I think the energy security, of course, it's uh, important for everyone and uh, in in France and uh, it's it's similar that there's obviously there's there's different ways I think how each country is trying to 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 support that they're obviously more resistant to any any let's say. Uh, deficiencies of energy so as uh, there is one question from rob i, I apologize i uh, because <laughs> you asked the question a, a few minutes ago um so it's the question is about the closed loop um, system so it's about the fluid choice uh, how can um, you what how can you utilize uh, let's say a, a certain fluid in a well what is the most common uh, fluids uh, to 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 use, and are the dual fluid heat exchangers commonly used? Uh, uh, well, hello, Rob. The the um, hello, Andy. The the most simple fluid to be used is water. You can you can just use water. Um, of course, the the. The, the point of the working fluid and the ability to change it um, is that you you kind of enhance the heat that you can transport to the surface. Um, so we're, we're looking at, for example, using hydrocarbons uh, like uh, propane um, as a working fluid. The, the moonshot, as they call it, is using supercritical carbon dioxide as a working fluid in a geothermal closed loop well. Um, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work, uh, but we have people working on that already. Uh, but it's, it is a fascinating subject, um, but it's, it's also a question you need to ask one of the physicists that we speak to rather than me. Uh, all I can tell you is that we have the ability to, to basically change them out. And that's one of the things that we'll be doing as we drill more wells and as we repurpose more wells, we'll be looking at the potential of using different fluids and looking at their, their varying performances um, of, of um, basically transporting that heat. OK, thank you. Um, and um, just going on from that, if you're using a well for uh, electricity generation, um, do you would you normally use a, a dual fluid system? So, for instance, water going down the well and something like ammonia on the surface? Uh, on the surface, we would use uh, an organic ranking cycle. Those literally come off a shelf. Um, that's that's the go-to at the moment. Um, however, there are new technologies coming in all the time, um, some of which are slightly out outlandish, but we look at all of them. We have a, a chief innovation officer who is actually forever um, actually listening to the people who come up with these crazy ideas um, because at some point one of them is going to work um, using compressed carbon dioxide uh, or carbon dioxide that's compressed with heat to drive a piston to generate electricity, things like that. They're, they sound very, very odd to me, um, but it's something that we look at. Anybody that comes to us and says, how about enhancing your system with this, then we'll look at it. Um, and every now and then we think, well, actually, that's going to work. So our, our approach is always going to be as holistic as possible. You look at every single thing that might give you an extra few degrees Celsius at surface. Um, and every, as long as it's going to be cost uh, effective, then we'll, we'll look at it and embrace it. Okay. Um, and just one more thing moving on from that. Um, 
You mentioned that the Serapy system uses uh, a fluid to go generally down the annulus, down the outside of the tubing, and then back up the middle. Um, and that, that acts as a, um, a, a downhole heat exchanger. Do you have, um, do you use insulated or vacuum insulated tubing in all or part of the wells to, to isolate the fluids? Yeah, uh, that, that's, it's a part of the toolbox for sure. Um, as you, you're obviously um, familiar, um, VIT is incredibly expensive. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, you have to basically cost it to make sure that it's worthwhile using um, in a project. Uh, I love the idea of it. There are also other things that you can do with pipe to uh, in, enhance the, the heat transfer. Um, I won't go into all the details, but uh, just because of the fact that their, our patent isn't uh, isn't complete yet, but um, there are uh, there are there's a myriad of things that you can do uh, to to ensure that your your BHAs and your pipes all the way to surface uh, kind of optimize the heat you can get up there. Okay, all right. that's great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for the questions. Thank you, Rob. And there's. Uh... A comment from Eric. I don't know if you want to uh, turn on your mic. It's about uh, Venden Vendenheim hot and deep wet geothermal project in France. Um, Eric just uh, shared some of his experience that they used the PDC bits and uh, mod motors that uh, it was the operator drilling team was from oil and gas. I don't know, Eric, if you want to Tell a little bit more to the about the project in France. Hello, I'm not sure you have the the camera on or whatever. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello, hello, yeah, Bonsoir. Okay. No, it was just a point. I mean, regarding the fact that um, the 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 competency transfer was uh, was addressed between oil and gas and geothermal and um, <clears throat> it's true that it's sometimes just amazing when you're coming from oil and gas and you uh, and you you look after or you participate to a project in, in geothermal to see the, the huge difference there is in uh, in technology and in knowledge and in uh, habits and so on also uh, even the people from oil and gas have to learn also a few things from from uh, geothermal people like uh, the, the rock mechanic part uh, is is critically important uh, in the geothermal drilling team when from my 30 years of experience it's a bit neglected uh, on the on the on the oil and gas part also we, we mostly drill in sedimentary rocks um, for the oil and gas which at least for, for the project I did participate in, in, in a geothermal was not the case at all. It was same as in Wales, like it was in granite, granite and uh, so it was very different. But this this transfer of knowledge of competency is uh, is something that definitely needs to be uh, to be addressed. I mean, and there is a lot of people um, in oil and gas who are looking forward to uh, to enter the geothermal uh, area, definitely. I've done both, yeah. so I'm, I'm pretty at ease to, to talk about it. But uh, I know a lot of geo oil and gas people who would like to, to switch to geothermal. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can say it, but you don't look at the, you don't look at your kids in the same way when you come from the rig side, having drilled the geothermal well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, no, you, 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 you get a special pride. <laughs> That you, yeah, you cannot you, really these day have uh, when you come from oil and gas. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, Eric. I I, I used to feel pretty good when I walked away from an oil and gas <laughs> well, also. But yeah, same for me, but same same quality of pride. <laughs> yeah, I, I I understand, and thanks very much for your comments. And, and you're right. There there is there is a massive uh, potential of transition from um, from oil and gas to geothermal, and that's. Uh, and uh, I mean, I've I've had these these discussions before. You look at people, and they're they're no longer oil and gas workers. They're no longer geothermal workers. They're energy workers, and they do some work in oil and gas. They do some work in geothermal. Um, if you look at geoscientists, for example, a lot of them work in uh, geophysicists, for example, doing um, feasibility yeah. studies for offshore wind. I mean, there are so many 
crossovers. Um, sometimes there are crossovers, uh, something that, that Scott mentioned, um, that maybe should happen and haven't. Um, I, I too attended a lot of webinars during uh, lockdown and uh, I remember talking uh, on, on an energy transition webinar and uh, there was a guy saying that he had spent decades uh, designing anchor handling, handling systems for mobile rigs and that uh, offshore wind was looking at the same uh, problems that, that, that uh, mobile rigs had had but they weren't willing to engage with oil and gas people who design, designed those, those um, uh, anchor systems for, for floating rigs. It doesn't make sense, but the problem is slowly being solved. I think the more conversations we have like this, the more people who actually make the transition from one uh, energy uh, source to another, or, or who maybe mix everything up, uh, the better. And as I say, I, I think that not just people, but companies are transitioning from just oil and gas companies to become energy companies. Um, and it's not all about branding. Some of them actually do. They, you know, uh, companies that used to be uh, oil and gas are now wind and geothermal, for example, BP and Shell have both invested in, in geothermal. Shell, um, Chevron, Chevron has too, uh, as well as wind and all these other uh, sources and, and so on. So I think as time goes by, those barriers will be broken down more and more. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to when it's not just one or the other. Yeah. Hope so too. <laughs> Thanks, Andy, anyway, for your answers. So all, all of my friends have joined today. I've got uh, loads of people on here I know. So it's it's it feels like a, what they call a fireside chat, just talking to old friends. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good good sign. I think it's a good sign if the friends are joining. It means uh, it's uh, they're still happy to to, to discuss um, everything. And uh, in terms of, uh, I, I had a question about the investment. Of course, it's uh, the closed loop system. Depending on where where you build it, uh, Scott shared uh, approximate uh, price. But for example, for your project in the UK, so who are actually people that invest? Is it like national companies? Is it private companies that invest in these projects? Um, our, well, there, there, there are different sources for investment, um, but we have a number of companies who have signed uh, letters of intent um, for as basically as many projects as we can find. You'll find that there are uh, green energy um, finance companies who specifically look for projects which are what they they refer to as shovel ready. They just want uh, a green project, energy project to be able to invest in. Um, and as I say, we have these promissory notes from uh, quite a few different uh, investment companies, um, and they're, they're they're keen on on basically helping the uh, the planet to generate as much. Uh, green energy as possible while still making some money. Um, so most of them that we're, we're finding are uh, are privately funded. Uh, but I mentioned the states earlier on, the, the current administration has, has put over a lot of money to help with the, the energy transition. And that is going to help a lot of projects. So I'm sure that some of that money will end up going towards some of the partners um, that we, we partner with in the states. Thank you, Andy. And uh, OK, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, OK, so thank you, Soraya. You ha she has shared uh, an article that everyone can review it. But if anyone else still wants to ask something or they feel that maybe something that uh, they wanted to know is still not answered, now, now it's the time. Can I ask one last question? Yes, this is the sure. last one. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, you said earlier that you didn't believe in using uh, supercritical carbon dioxide. Uh, I was just wondering why. No, I didn't say I didn't believe in it. I said I didn't understand it. Okay. <laughs> it's so, it it's something it's something that um, that we are looking into. Um, 
well, our, our academic partners are looking into in conjunction with with our technical team. Um, but it, it's it's a long way off at the moment, but it's something that's that's worth investigation. Um, as I said, everything that we can do to make our systems more efficient is worth looking into. Uh, as long as it's not completely um, off the wall, as long as it's not unachievable, then we'll spend the time and the money looking at, uh, at how we can use different fluids, different processes, different people to do different jobs. Uh, we we have a completely holistic approach. So uh, no, supercritical carbon dioxide is, I think the idea of it's fantastic. Um, but uh, no, it, it's something that we might potentially use in the future. Okay, so you think that's maybe not the optimal fluid, but do, do you think that also maybe it's considered also because it can be, this solution can be seen as a way to also store CO2 as a combination with geothermal? Not really, because, because, um, because the, the volumes that we're looking at are, are relatively small. Okay. However, the the, uh, the project that we did for Magnus in the North Sea um, did look at potential of, of partnering closed loop geothermal with carbon capture and storage. So you use geothermal energy to provide the energy for the carbon capture and storage process. Um, so you know where there's a will, there's a way. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for your questions. Thank you, Andy. It's uh, yes, it's and great. Thank you, uh, Sarai, as well for for engaging in the in the discussion. I think it's uh, it's uh, great. And I think from my side, you didn't touch too much about the heat source pump, but uh, but I know that um, in Europe, it obviously has gotten a lot more attention because it's something that um, would not require such a large investment uh, I think you could even like a small business or a private investor could consider um, installing that so what's what's your thoughts of course your the closed loop system I understand that it's for a larger scale but uh, let's say as an individual if you have a let's say private house should you be thinking maybe to install the heat source pump yes grounds ground source heat pumps uh, Ground, okay. Because, because there's also air source heat pumps, and I'm told that they're much less efficient. Um, and when the temperatures get very low, they're, they're not very good. Uh, but ground source heat pumps are magical. They're a fantastic solution at, at relatively small scale. And, and uh, they're becoming more and more, more popular for private residences in the UK or uh, collections of pri private residences. But the, the limitation with them is that you can... You can kind of block them together and you can create networks of them, but they get to a certain size where the infrastructure associated with them is perhaps too challenging. Uh, and at that point, it's worth looking at a, a, a geothermal well. Uh, but I, I think that uh, ground source heat pumps are a great solution. And next time I build a house, I'm going to have one. Yes, let's hope all of us will have it because, of course, that's. Uh, uh, I think the what the discussion what I have heard uh, just uh, when I was doing actually my degree in the renewables was that uh, a lot of talks have been about hydrogen, about uh, uh, heating with hydrogen, but only I would say maybe last couple of years the geothermal energy uh, came into into the picture uh, it, it w has been there for a long time but it was on small scale so I also hope that uh, maybe this year it will be the geothermal year well uh, thanks for the kind words and, and as I say uh, gatherings like this are helping to spread the awareness so I, I, I very much appreciate it thanks a lot and uh, if I, I can see that there are no more questions, so uh, as they say, silence is gold. <laughs> so I think what we could do, uh, it's of course we want to hear about your pilot project, how it, uh, what happens to it, uh, you know, the, here maybe a little bit more detail. So I, I think maybe after a few months, uh, uh, let's say when you are ready, it would be nice to have another session just to 
hear your experience of uh, of how how the project uh, went and uh, for us as well but maybe there's some lessons learned that uh, i think would be interesting for for the audience but uh, thanks a lot for your time today i think it was a great discussion we all enjoyed and thanks to everyone for questions and uh, hopefully we see you soon in the next 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 events <laughs>